All right, so during the course of this workshop, we're, you're all going to be seeing various aspects of additive combinatorics. It's a relatively newer area of mathematics compared to some older things like analysis and other parts of mathematics. Uh, but one of the ones that I'm going to focus on during my series is what's called set addition. So also sometimes goes by the term sum sets. And we're going to, I'm going to talk a lot about some basic results involving sum sets, which is the addition of sets. So what I'm going to be talking about, well, we'll try and keep the notation a little consistent. Your G is going to be an abelian group. And we're going to write that additively. So our operation is going to be plus. And we don't study the actual abelian group itself. We're interested more in the subsets of this group. So say A and B are going to be finite, non-empty subsets. All right, there are questions you can ask involving infinite subsets, but I'm going to focus on the finite case. Uh, and again, we don't just study the sets themselves. We want to take advantage of the additive structure. So we define this A plus B. It's a very natural definition. We just take all possible sums, little a plus little b, with a living in big A, little b living in big B. And this is called the sum set of A plus B. And it's this structure over here that we're going to be studying uh, in this lecture series over here of mine. And of course, we can add more than two summons. If we have, say, a1, a2 up to a n inside G, but we can also define the n-fold sum set, we'll sum from i equals 1 to n of all the ai's, just by taking you know, the summons from each individual sum. So it's just all things in the form of the sum of the little ai's with each of the little ai's and the, the big ai. So we're just looking at sums. The elements come from each of the, the larger summons. And this is just the sum set of uh, more than one set. Um, we might use this abbreviation, n times a for the sum of set a with itself n times. And so we're not actually just multiplying every element of the set a by n. When we do this, we're actually looking at the, the n-fold sum set, where we're adding a to itself n times. Uh, and this lecture is going to start off fairly simple. We're going to start off with some basic lower bounds. And then I want to talk a little about a, a very fundamental result in out of combinatorics in this area of some sets called Knazer's theorem. Let's start off with just a little example of what the, the sum set looks like. So for instance, we could have some elements like 0, 1, and then 4. And we could try and add this to maybe the elements 1, 2, and 5. So this is the, the sum of these two sets. We add this all up together. We take all possible you know, options. We have the 0 that can be paired up with anything from the other set, the 1 with the everything, and the 4 with everything. So we have, for instance, 0 plus 1, 0 plus 2, 0 plus 5, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 5, 4 plus 1, 4 plus 2, and 4 plus 5. And of course, we have to, this first element is equal to 1, 2, 5, 2, 3, 6, 5, 6, and 9. And of course, we don't care about the repetition. So in the end, we have something that looks like 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 9. All right. Assuming they're integers. 
So there's nothing really complicated going on when we're defining this, this basic concept, uh, but the questions get fairly complicated soon enough. Now you might ask, um, and one of the, the main questions is how, how large these, the sum sets can grow. So here's a very basic lower bound. So G is going to be torsion free. And the sum sets are always going to be finite and not empty. I'm not going to repeat this every single time. So here A and B. Right. Then we have this bound. The sum set is at least the size of the cardinalities added together minus 1. So again, uh, this is going to be a standard assumption. The sets are always going to be finite and not empty. Because of course, if A is empty, then the, the sum set is empty, and you don't have this, this growth going here. So it is very important that it be not empty. Uh, I'm only going to prove this quickly in the case when G is equal to Z, because we'll see this follows as a more general case of the Knazer's theorem afterwards. But it might be worthwhile to see a basic case. So let's look at the, a very simple case. What if B has just one element? All right. It's just some element x. Well, then we have the cardinality of A plus x. This is just a translate of A, and it's the same size as A. You've just you know, shifted over all the elements of A. And this is actually just equal to A plus b minus 1, because b has one element in it. So there's a case where equality could occur. So in that case, it's true, and equality holds. So we can assume that b has at least two elements. Now, what, what's often common when studying some sets is we don't, we don't care about which translate of the sets a and b we're going to use. Uh, like I said, if you just translate A, you're, you're just shifting everything in a fixed rigid motion. The set is essentially the same as far as regards of adding it to any other set. Uh, and the same thing with B, and if I translate A, you know, it's going to be the same thing as just translate A plus B by that same amount. So we can replace A and B by any translates we want, and it's not going to change anything. So we're often going to do this. It just makes things life easier if maybe we translate so that everything contains zero. So right now, I'm just going to simply translate my sets A and B so they start with 0 as the smallest element and have some largest element afterwards. Let's just assume that 0 is the smallest element in both A and B. M is the biggest element inside A. N is the biggest element inside B, which is, of course, bigger than 0 because we have two elements inside B, at least. And now consider M plus N. That's inside A plus B. Right, because M is the maximum element it's inside there. In fact, this is equal to the maximum of all the elements inside the sum set. We have everything ordered. But if I just remove N from B, it's no longer to be there, because the only way to achieve the maximum in, inside the set A plus B is to take the largest element in A with the largest element in B. If we don't have the largest element in B, if we got rid of it, it'll be gone. Right. There's only one way to represent m plus m inside a plus b. We have to use the largest thing in a and the largest thing in b. We have this monotone ordering. So that means the cardinality went down by 1. And so here we just simply use uh, an inductive argument. So let's just proceed by induction on the cardinality of b, 
And now we can uh, apply the induction hypothesis to this set over here. So then our induction hypothesis, that means that a plus b minus n at least the cardinality of A plus B minus N minus 1. Well, that's A plus B minus 2. And as we just saw, this one's at least one more. So it's at least A plus B minus 1. That's it. It's a very simple proof. And if you want to move to the more general towards a free case, you could try and reduce it down to this case. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it because it's going to be a special case of Canadian's theorem where we'll see later on. So this is a very basic argument. Don't be fooled. Uh, the arguments get much more complicated very quickly. Uh, but we're not going to present too many complicated proofs uh, during this series. I'm going to talk more about the results and every now and then give one of the arguments when they're nice and simple. But the key thing to sort of take from this is we did have to sort of have this notion of a unique expression element. So maybe I should uh, give some notation for that. So we'll let this, our a plus b of x, be the sort of the number of representations. All right, with a and a and b inside b. So there are lots of ways to maybe write the element x as a sum from a and b. You know, over here we, for instance, the element 2 had two different ways of being written, 0 plus 2 and 1 plus 1. The other element 1 here had a unique way, 0 plus 1, because it was the smallest element inside this ordered set. We were. So we'll just let uh, this one be the number of representations. And there's a nice little observation. This is really the cardinality of a minus b intersect a. Also, the cardinality of x minus a intersect b. Now, this is kind of an important but very basic observation. Why is this the case? Well, let's look at everything. Of, we have uh, a being inside x minus b intersect a. Well, that corresponds to a being an element of a and a equaling x minus b for some b inside b. And of course, together, I mean, we just rewrite that. That means that x equals a plus b. These are all the ways to, this is basically saying these are all the elements of a which can be used to represent x. Right, so it's just all the a for which we can find a b, we add them together, we get x. And we know each a has at most one. Everything is added inverse, so this is just how many representations we have. And of course, this is the other one over here. This would be uh, how many b, uh, all the elements of b, which we could find some element a, which we added to that element, we gave us the x. So let's now give another very basic result, this time for a finite group. Here, g is finite. We have our a and b contained inside g. And we're going to assume we have at least g plus 1 elements between a and b. The conclusion is that a plus b equals g in this case. We get everything. Couldn't have more elements. And this is sometimes, uh, to reference, this is the, the pigeonhole bound. OK. 
because we're seeing this is just a basic consequence of the pigeonhole principle. We heard about that in the previous lecture. Uh, we're going to see it again right over here in a, in a different form. All right, so if we want to show that a plus b equals g, we need to take an arbitrary element of g and show that it's inside a plus b. So let's let uh, x and g be arbitrary. All right, so the number of representations of x inside a plus b, which we need to show is at least one, this should be x minus b intersect a. But how many elements does x minus b have? Just the size of b, and the size of a is a. All right, together, they have more elements that exist. They have g plus 1. So between the two of them, between this set of size b and this set of size a, there has to be at least one element in common, because otherwise there'd, you know, there'd be g plus 1 elements to choose from, and we only have g to choose. So this has to be at least G, uh, one by the pigeonhole principle. All right, there just are too many elements, uh, and this hypothesis is right here. And that's true. That means it's inside the sum set. Well, that's it. That's the proof. That's very simple. And of course, if you had to increase this bound by to two, then this would be increased by two, and you have everyone having two representations, and so on. So you could actually just change this up very quickly and say, but the, the special case really follows from the first case, and that's the most important uh, sort of instance of it. Now, that first result I put on the board was involving a torsion-free group. We saw that there, the, the lower bound we have, of the, the very basic one, was at least the sum of the cardinalities minus 1. We had that hypothesis of being torsion-free, and it's therefore an important reason. Uh, for instance, if h is a subgroup, say it's finite, and say a equals h, which is the same thing as b, well, then A plus B is just H plus H, and subgroups happen to be closed under addition. That would just be H. And in that case, the cardinality would just be uh, equal to A, which is equal to B, equal to H. We wouldn't get any new elements at all. So the, in this case here, it would be much smaller than the sum A plus B minus 1. In fact, this would be the smallest it can be, because it's always going to be at least the cardinality of A and the cardinality of B. We can, in A plus B, there's always a translate of A. There's always a translate of B, because our sets are not empty. So you know, being at least the cardinality of A is always the case. At least the cardinality of B, always the case. And here's a case where equality can hold. So it's a bit small on the A plus B minus 1. Uh, and this behavior of sort of having things trapped inside a smaller subgroup is, in some sense, the only way that this fails to hold, that, that bound from the torsion-free case. And that's a, a, a more difficult theorem, which is Knazer's theorem, which I want to talk about next. Uh, and to do this, let's introduce a little bit of notation. So let's take a subset A inside G. I'm going to define H of A to be all the elements X inside G, so that X plus A equals A the stabilizer. All right. so it looks just like the stabilizer you might have seen in algebra, because that's what it is. This is a subgroup. All right. That's very easy to check. You can check that zeros inside there. And if you know x and y are inside there, then of course their sum is inside there. It's closed under addition, closed under subtraction to x plus a, you can just move the x to the other side. You get negative x plus a equals a, and so on. So it's, it's a subgroup. Um, right, 
right? And of course, if h is going to be equal to h of a, then a is a union of h cosets. Um, maybe it will sort of be helpful. I'll often sometimes draw little pictures like this. You can sort of imagine these are each of possible h cosets. Maybe this is 0 plus h. There's some other a plus h, and there b plus h, right? These are the different cosets that are inside our, your group. And if your set is closed under addition, well, that means it has all the, if it contains one element from the coset, it has to have all of them, right? Because H plus A equals A by definition, because everything inside H leaves A alone. So if you have a single element from a coset, you have all the elements from the coset inside A. So these are either all completely filled or all completely empty. So here's one fully coset, another one that maybe there's no elements and it's empty, another one, if it has one element, has all of them, it's completely full. They're not formal pictures here, but it's often very, I often find it very helpful when I sort of draw these little cosine decompositions uh, to sort of, you know, write them down as a little picture, whether you, however you like to most uh, to write this down. Um, but this important information about the stabilizers corresponds into a little bit more of a geometric picture afterwards. So now let's uh, state Knazer's theorem. This was proven, I think, in the, the middle of the 1900s. Uh, I think it was early 60s, late 50s. So G is an abelian group. And we have our standard A and B inside G, which are finite and non-empty. And H is the stabilizer. Oh. Of A plus B, so it's a subgroup. And the conclusion, and there are lots of equivalent inclusions, and I'm gonna write down several afterwards that are equivalent to the statement, but here's the most typical one that's often quoted, is that the cardinality of A plus B is at least the sum of A plus H, B plus H minus H. There it is. It's a very simple looking there. Not quite so simple to prove. Uh, but feel free to try and prove this afterwards. It's, uh, I mean, the proof doesn't, doesn't spend, you know, pages and pages and pages, but it requires some bit of cleverness. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was first learning about additive combinatorics, I had never seen Knazer's theorem before, and I was working on something involving Ramsey theory, involving some zero sums, and, and I had conjectured that this theorem must hold, because it was what I needed for it to hold, and I was trying to prove it at the time, and, and then someone just uh, gave me a reference for Knazer's theorem, and I realized oh, someone had already done it. So I didn't have to worry about trying to prove it, I could just use it. Uh, there are different ways of viewing this, so let's, uh, some equivalent formulations. Uh, for instance, let's, we're going to say that A plus B is aperiodic. That corresponds to the stabilizer being trivial. And we say it's periodic when that's not the case. We might actually be more uh, concrete. We might say that A plus B is K periodic. That means uh, K is a subgroup of the stabilizer. It's the same thing to say that A plus B is a union of K cosets. Uh, 
So there's some various terminology you might see throughout the course of the lectures. So aperiodic is when they're, they're everything, it's not a unique process. It's, the stabilizer is trivial. The periodic case means when we have a non-trivial stabilizer. A is a union, these sort of blocks. And if we don't really care about having the largest block size be the stabilizer, we might just simply refer to it being K periodic. So it's just a subgroup of the stabilizer. There's just a union of K cosets, but it might also be a union of uh, H cosets for a larger subgroup. All right, so in the case when the stabilizer is trivial, we get the Cauchy Devon, uh, the bound from the torsion free case. So It's also actually equivalent to the statement. Because it's not too hard, and it's, it's a very typical thing that often comes up that you can reduce the periodic case to the aperiodic case by sort of modding out by the maximal period. These blocks afterwards, we're going to do that in, in other cases. Uh, of course, there's a very special instance of this Canasius theorem. If we're in a torsion free group, all our non trivial subgroups are infinite, right? And this stabilizer has to be finite, because A plus B is a union of H cosets, and it's a finite set. So this H has to be finite. If we're in a torsion-free group, the only finite group is the trivial one. And therefore, H is trivial, so we get A plus B minus 1. That very beginning theorem I wrote on the board is just actually a special case of this in the complete torsion-free setting, because there are no options for A, for H. Now we can also state this for more than one sum end. We could iterate this bound if we just applied it multiple times in a row. If we have, say, the sum set, more than one set, the AIs is aperiodic. Well, that means the cardinality is at least the sum of the cardinalities. minus n plus 1. Basically, we would just iteratively apply this special case over here. Uh, and we do it n minus 1 times, so we get the minus 1 n minus 1 times. And this would, of course, it's more general than this, but it, it's implied by that. You just iterate it. And of course, we can multiply all this by a h in the, the periodic case. more or less just would multiply everything by h. Uh, and why are these equivalent? Um, what I may use a lot over here, I'll use this phi of h for the natural homomorphism. All right. And there's some very basic properties. For instance, if h is the stabilizer of a plus b, and when we mod out by the maximal period, we're, we have to have an aperiodic subset afterwards. We can't suddenly have it being periodic with something because we could lift that up to the original set. So if you start off with something being periodic, you mod out by the maximal period, the stabilizer, the resulting set is going to be aperiodic. This is just routine. Feel free to, to double check the details afterwards. And of course, if we have phi of h of a plus b, this distributes because it's a homomorphism. Right, 
and the, the definitions are just all pairwise. So phi h of a plus b is just the phi h of a plus phi h of b. So if you have uh, something that's periodic, you would just simply mod up by the period and apply the aperiodic case, and then multiply the result by h. Right. Right, so when you take this one over here, for instance, you would apply the a periodic case to the sum set. You get phi h of a plus phi h of b is at least phi h, some, these sum sets here. Right, and we just multiply this by h. And this becomes h plus a plus b being at least a plus h plus b plus h minus h. But of course, since this is the this, this stabilizer for a plus b, this is the same thing as a plus b because everything in h plus a plus b leaves it alone. That's this definition. So that's more or less how this, this, period, this statement over here would imply that one. Now let's state some uh, more consequences of Knazer's theorem. So here's a theorem from 1813, proven by Cauchy. And later by Davenport, over a hundred years later, because uh, so you may have seen the poster for the the additive combinatorics workshop, and there is a mysterious formula on the poster as well as a mysterious portrait. The portrait is, if I understand, I likely of uh, Cauchy, and the formula is a special case of Knazer's theorem. So let's see what happens when G is z mod pz with p prime. So Knazer's theorem says that we have the stabilizer, but there are only two options for the stabilizer because a cyclic group of prime order only has two subgroups, the trivial subgroup or everything. So. Right. If we had the trivial subgroup, then Knazer's theorem would say that we'd have A plus B minus one elements, because H would be trivial. Right. But the other option is that the stabilizer is the entire group. But if the stabilizer is the entire group, then A plus B is a union of G cosets. Well, I mean, there's just one of them, so it must be the entire group. It's just G, which has order P. We would have every element inside the group. And so far, we get the minimum of these two possibilities. And so, of course, since it's more or less the analog of that torsion free case, because there we'd always have the sum of the cardinalities minus one, but since we're in a finite universe, we could never have more elements than exist in that universe, never more than p. But more or less, we get that same bound a plus b minus 1, as long as we don't go beyond the bound p. And this is the Cauchy Davenport theorem. And it's what's displayed on the portrait. Here's another nice simple consequence which is going to highlight maybe a different way to view Knazer's theorem. So let's say 
G is an abelian group. A and B are subsets. And suppose A plus B has a unique expression element. For instance, when we were in the torsion, the, the Z case for our proof there, we were guaranteed it because the maximum element of A plus B was always unique expression. Because we had a nice way to order all the elements inside uh, the, the integers. Well, the conclusion is that we, we have the bound then, the same one. A plus B minus 1. So we can give a short little proof of this. So we have a unique expression element. Let's give it a name. I don't know, alpha plus beta and A plus B with alpha inside A, beta inside B, be a unique expression element. And now let's look at the, let's slice our sets A and B by cosets. So let's define A alpha to be all those elements from the coset alpha plus H inside A. And B beta will be everything from the coset beta plus H inside B. These are both non-empty because alpha is inside A and beta is inside B. So this is a, a, you know, if we had the picture here, we, we're looking at our sets over here, and, you know, they're not, they're partially filled cosets. The sum set has everything either there or not there, but inside the sets A and B, there may or not be elements missing. And Knazer's theorem, it looks like a lower bound, but it's in fact uh, an example of more like a, an inverse result, which we'll see, we'll talk more about tomorrow. It's more or less saying, well, if we're below this bound A plus B minus 1, if we have less elements than that, it's saying there's structure to the sets. A plus B can be approximated by a, U, a set which is a, A and B, which are unions of H cosets. Because we could write this bound differently. Let's maybe define rho to be A plus H minus A plus B plus H minus B. Let's call this the number of holes. I'll put that in quotes. In A and B, right? Because we could sort of decompose H in terms of its cosets. Here's A and here's B. Sometimes there's going to be elements missing. Other times maybe everything is there. When we get to A plus B, either everything is inside a coset or everything is not. But inside the original sets, they're not. But A plus H is just A filling in all the holes. And B is everything in B with filling in all the holes. And of course, A plus H plus B plus H has the same sum set as A plus B. We've sort of added in, we fill in holes and haven't changed the sum set at all. So we're approximating our set A plus B by sets that are unions of cosets. And there can't be that many holes in here because we could write this bound as saying A plus B minus H plus that number of holes, right? It's the same bound, just using this definition here, but with respect to the original cardinalities. So for below this bound, A plus B minus 1, which we're going to assume for this proof, there can't be that many holes inside the set. So we're going to apply Knazer's theorem. We get a non-trivial stabilizer.
we don't have that many holes. We have at most h minus 2 holes, because otherwise we'd be up to a plus b minus 1. So there, there aren't that many elements missing from these cosets. Right, so that means we have a lot of elements in A alpha and B, B, B beta. I mean, in the worst case, all the holes amongst A is concentrated in this one single coset. And all the holes in the entire set B are all contained in this coset over here. But in that worst case, we'd have no more than H minus 1 elements missing. All right, if we had no elements missing, we'd have 2H elements. We can't have more than row elements missing, so that's at least h plus 2. All right, this, this looks a little familiar. We have two sets from a finite group, essentially. I mean, up to translation. Remember, it doesn't matter. Translation is the same. This is a contained inside alpha plus h, and this one here is contained inside beta plus h. But when it comes to some sets, translation is more or less there's no difference there. This, this might as well be came, contained inside H, this inside B, and, and this one as well. We could just translate our set so that alpha was 0 and beta was 0. And in that case, both these sets, these coset slices, would both live inside this single finite group H. And there'd be at least H plus 2 elements. So we could go back to that original result, that pigeonhole bound. It said if we had two finite sets of a finite group, H is finite, it's the stabilizer. And we, between them, there were at least the group's order plus 2. There'd have to be two representations for everything inside A alpha plus B alpha. All these two. All right, so then alpha plus beta can't be a unique expression element, because I can find a second representation just using these two cosets, from the same cosets that alpha came from and beta came from. And that's in addition to any representations that might be coming from different cosets. So this contradiction. <laughs> completes the proof. Can't happen. So this is an, an example where this kind of geometric viewpoint of viewing this bound as more being a, about approximating A and B by H periodic sets with not too many holes inside those approximating sets can be helpful. Right, we slice by the cosets. We know that each of those slices, these, this coset slice here, A alpha and beta alpha, B beta, have lots of elements because there can't be that many holes, elements missing. And that's enough that we can then apply the pigeonhole bound to guarantee lots of representations just between those two coset slices, never mind between other slices that add up to the same coset. All right, questions so far? Yeah. Uh, this one over here? Oh, I'm just rewriting this, right? Because this is, if you substitute this in over here, you have A plus H minus B. This is the same thing as saying A plus H minus A, because it's a subset plus b plus h minus b. And now just substitute this one over here, and the a and b disappears. It's replaced by a plus h and b plus h. 
Or, oh. Oh, a philosophy for it? Um, I, it? It has to be small. I'm not sure what you mean by philosophy. Okay, okay, I'm not quite understanding the question, I fear. Oh, like what we just did over here. Like I say, for instance, if we're below, if this is, Right, that means then the number of holes was at most h minus 2 in this case. That was, we, for this example over here, we, we were assuming by contradiction we were below that bound. So our number of holes was no more than h minus 2 holes. And that's where we got this bound over here. We used that bound right there. And so that gave us lots of elements between the, the two, any two slices. Any two slices. We looked at them, had so many elements that when you added them together, you got everything. The entire coset. Is that better? Or? Okay. Um, so right now I have two options. I can either give another example of a result that's a little more complicated proving it, or I can give a, a generalization of Knazer's theorem. And I think I'm actually going to talk about a generalization. F is itself a k-vector space. We could look at two other k-vector spaces, A and B, that live inside F. And we could look at their, their product over here. Let's just define this to be the, the k-space generated by the elements A times B. So if you like, this is like all finite sums of the form A times B. Uh, yeah. So it looks similar to a, a sum set, but it's now like a product set. And we have to then close it on the operation of the vector space, so we're taking finite sums. Now we could define a stabilizer for this uh, k vector space as being all the elements inside f. Kind of leave it alone. It can't be zero. And this will be a, a subfield. K will certainly leave A times B alone because this is a K vector space. So it's going to contain K. It can't be bigger than F. And you can check that it's, you know, X, X inverse is going to be inside there. The sum of two elements will be inside there, the, the product and so on. Uh, and we have this sort of uh, extension. It looks like this. Let's have a field extension. Oh, we're just multiplying it, uh, regular multiplication, right? So this, this would just be a regular multiplication, not like a sum, pool, a, a sum set. This is just the multiplication. Just take everything in AB and multiply it by X. Yeah. And you just see it leaves it alone like the normal stabilizer. So let's take uh, finite dimensional subspaces. Let E maybe be this 
intermediary field. Uh, and let's use, uh, well, for the dimension of A over our base field K. I mean, it looks a little bit strange, but let's, let's just get to tie it into kinetic theorem a little better. So the dimension of the, the space A times B is going to be the dimension of basically E times A plus E times B minus E. It looks just like Knazer's theorem. And again, the A, well, when we multiply this, this is going to be an E vector space. This is maybe more or less the dimension of A regarded as an E vector space once we close it under the operation of E. And this will be the same thing if we view the, the set at B, but we have to then close it under a multiplication by E. So it gets to be a slightly bigger set. Uh, and this is sort of a vector space analog of Knazer's theorem. Um, you can actually deduce Knazer's theorem from this vector space analog. If you choose your field extensions uh, with cleverly enough, I'm not going to do that, but you can do it. You can then actually deduce Knazer's theorem from this vector space version. Um, it was originally proved under some additional technical assumptions. So this was uh, proven uh, in the early 2000s or something like that. But it had to assume that the field extension was more or less separable. Or you could do sl something slightly weaker, but it was more or less for separable field extensions uh, because you, where you didn't have an infinite number of intermediary fields, some issues like that coming up. Uh, but there were never any counterexamples, and it looked to be more or less like a technical assumption that was just needed for the proofs to work. And there were more than one proof that could work, but they each needed some kind of technical assumption. And eventually, um, Uriel Serra and oh, there are a couple other authors were able to remove the hypothesis, and so it would work for any field extension afterwards. Uh, and their proof was more or less uh, because there are more than one proof of Knazer's theorem. I didn't talk about a proof. They're, they're all various, not so simple. I mean, they're not so difficult, but we'd have to spend probably the entire hour just giving the proof of Knazer's theorem. And there are different proofs. There's the original proof of Knazer. Uh, there's also a variation on that. And there are other proofs. And one of the other proofs was a IC perimetric proof. So there's this something that was sort of promoted by Yaya Hamadoun uh, from in, the, in Paris and France. And it's a different, I'm not going to talk too much about the IC perimetric method, but it was a different way of proving something. And uh, Eric Bellandrod gave an IC perimetric proof of the Canadian theorem, actually a strengthening of it. And that proof generalized to the vector spaces without any assumption. And it gave this more general result right here. So we're just about at the time right now. So I think I'm going to stop right now. Next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, more about inverse questions, the, the most basic one. Or again, we're going to focus on this bound, A plus B minus 1, because the Kayser's theorem is sort of telling us something about the structure when it's below that bound. But it's only a weak approximation. It says that A plus B can be approximated by H periodic sets, but it doesn't tell us what those sets look like. So next time, we're going to see at a precise description of what can actually happen in that uh, sub-threshold below this critical bound where torsion and, and non-torsion free behavior changes. Uh, oh, and it's just done. So that's all.